right. All right. Good evening, everyone. All right. All right. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome. I'm State Senator Jason Lewis, and um, I want to welcome you to our latest uh, community conversation. Uh, we host community conversations on different um, issues that are timely and we, of interest to the residents of our communities. And the idea is to be able to hear from uh, expert speakers on the topic and, and then to make sure there's time for your feedback for me and for our speakers and uh, questions and discussion. Um, so uh, before we dive in, um, we're very fortunate tonight to be joined by a number of our local uh, leaders, local elected officials from our select boards, town council, school committee. And I think uh, what I'm going to do is actually if, if we could just quickly introduce yourselves um, so everyone knows who's here. So maybe we'll just start in the back since I see a couple of our town councilors. Just introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Julie Smith Gallagher, Hill Town Councilor. Hi, I'm Mary Wakefield, Town Council. So, DJ, go ahead. Board of Health, too? DJ Wilson, all the Board of Health. Great. Good. Um, other other like, local elected officials? Yeah. Yep. And sure. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Ruth, introduce yourself. All right, excellent, thank you all. Um, I also wanna thank some of our other co-sponsors tonight, um, both of our state representatives uh, in the area, Paul Broder and Donald Wong, and, um, and then our local um, prevention coalitions, the, including the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, the Melrose Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, Malden Overcoming Addiction, the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, the Stoneham Coalition for a Safe and Healthy Community, um, the Wakefield Unified Prevention, Wake Up, and the Winchester Coalition for a Safer Community. Um, all do amazing work in our communities around education and prevention, and we're so grateful for the work of our local substance abuse coalitions. We also owe a, th a special thank you tonight to uh, Margie Daniels and Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth, um, and um, there we're gonna hear from Margie in, in, in a moment. And for those who don't know, Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth used to be called Middlesex Partnerships for Youth and uh, changed their name to reflect the broad uh, group of schools that they are serving in a number of important ways, including education on uh, vaping. I also just want to thank um, Wakefield Community Access Television um, for recording tonight and uh, all the good uh, um, civic engagement that you support. And thank you to Tom Dalton and Emily Grana from my team uh, for working hard to put the event uh, together tonight. Um, as you know, our topic is the um, epidemic, really, of youth um, use of e-cigarettes and vaping products. Um, we have worked very hard for decades now um, to bring down the rates of traditional tobacco use, and we've been very successful in, in doing that and fighting back against big tobacco. And just when we thought that we had finally you know, uh, won that battle or were on the verge of winning that battle, Along comes uh, e-cigarettes, and because of um, predatory companies uh, like Juul, and you'll hear more about them tonight, and many others, um, they are bent on addicting our teenagers uh, once again to nicotine and, um, and hooking them on their products so that uh, they can profit from addiction. And it is a major, major concern. Uh, we saw this coming a number of years ago but it has really accelerated in recent years, and it's also spread across all of our schools. So I was already seeing this in some of our schools a few years ago, and then just recently, I got a call from the principal of Malden High School saying, hey, do you know about this? What's going on? We're suddenly seeing this all over Malden High School. And, um, and it's just, you know, this is just spread like a virus um, across our schools, middle schools, high schools, urban, communities, suburban communities, rural communities. Um, in fact, um, last year, the FDA declared youth vaping an, an epidemic. And uh, under former commissioner Scott Gottlieb actually be, had, had launched, begun taking some, um, some serious steps. And I hope the FDA will continue to take action um, as they should. 
Um, here in Massachusetts, um, we haven't been um, uh, just sitting back and doing nothing. We have been working to address this epidemic at the local level and at the state level. Uh, at the state level, um, some of you may be aware of an important new law that we passed uh, last year. A uh, number of us uh, in the room tonight had, have worked on this for a long time, and I appreciate so much all the grassroots support, and I really appreciate um, Commissioner Burrell's support within the Baker administration for this. But the uh, law is called an Act to Protect Youth from the Health Risks of Tobacco and Nicotine Addiction, and I was happy to help lead this bill through the state legislature as the chair of the Public Health Committee. And it does three things. It raises the legal age for the sale of any kind of tobacco products, including vaping products, from 18 to 21 statewide. So before that, while some of most of our commu local communities already had raised the age through the actions of our boards of health, that was not true, for example, in Woburn and other communities. And so teenagers were still able to get access to these products very easily. So that, cha that has now changed as of December 31st of last year. Importantly, this new law for the first time added vaping products, e-cigarettes, to our state's definition of tobacco products. The vaping industry has fought this hard because they don't want to be considered tobacco products. They want to be treated differently. But our state law does say that vaping products are tobacco products. And for example, what that means is that any place where you can't smoke cigarettes, you know, schools, restaurants, workplaces, you are not legally allowed to vape either. And then third, the new law prohibited the sale of any tobacco products, including vaping products, in any healthcare facilities. So, for example, pharmacies would come under that, under that prohibition as well. Um, then, uh, just last week, the state senate released our budget for the next fiscal year, which starts on July 1st. And I'm very pleased uh, that within our budget, we include a new 75% um, uh, excise tax on the wholesale value of all um, e-cigarette products. So up till now, and, and, and currently, those products are subject only to a regular sales tax and nothing like the tobacco excise taxes on cigarettes or chewing tobacco or cigars. So if we're successful in getting this through into the final budget, we will finally be treating vaping products from a tax perspective the same way. And we know from a lot of public health research that when you raise the price of tobacco products, it's very effective in deterring our young people, our teenagers, from using those products. So we're, we're hopeful that that will, will make it into the final budget. Um, we've also, at the state level, had tremendous work on the part of our Department of Public Health, led by Commissioner Burrell. And you're going to hear, thank you so much, Emily. We're going to hear about that tonight. And we've also had great work on the legal and regulatory front from our state attorney general, Maura Healy. And, um, Elise Yannett from her office, who's doing incredible work, uh, really around the, leading the effort around the country on, um, on holding these companies like Juul accountable. And we're going to hear more on that tonight. Um, we also uh, have fantastic local efforts underway. As I mentioned, a lot of that's led by our local coalitions, many of whom are in the room tonight, and also by our incredible students. Um, and we have a number of our students, along with Maureen Busby, who many of you know does great work on tobacco control in our communities, who are also going to share kind of the local perspective of what we're doing tonight. Before I wrap up, just wanted to mention there are several additional legislative efforts that we are working on in the state legislature for this session. I already mentioned the effort to add a new excise tax on vaping products. We also have a new bill. Um, that was filed by my colleague Senator John Keenan and also by Representative um, Danielle Gregoire, which would um, uh, ban the sale of any flavored tobacco products. So that already exists for traditional cigarettes other than menthol, um, but this would apply to menthol and it would apply to all of the flavors for vapes, which um, many of you know are really, uh, many of them are, those flavors are designed to appeal to kids. You know, bubble gum, cotton candy, um, all kinds of fruit flavors. So that's a very important bill and, um, and we're looking forward to moving that forward. And then I filed a, a new piece of legislation also this session which will, would increase the penalties for retailers who sell, illegally sell tobacco products, including vaping products, to minors. Right now, 
It's a very, very minor a penalty. It's just a small fine. And if this bill passes, it would increase those fines significantly to act as a real deterrent for retailers, either brick and mortar, mortar or online, to sell these products to our kids. Um, most important of all, though, legislative efforts are great. You know, the work that the Department of Public Health is doing is great and the, and, the, and the AG, but the most important thing we can do is educate parents about the dangers of vaping products for kids, make sure they know these are not safe, they contain nicotine, they contain other harmful chemicals. Um, we need to educate parents, students, of course, and teachers. That's the most important. And so the, really the aim of the forum and the conversation tonight is to make sure we reach more people so that they are well educated and they understand what the uh, risks are here. Um, so in a moment, I'll in, I'm going to invite uh, Margie up to say a few words, and then we'll hear from each of our fantastic speakers. Each will speak for about 10 minutes or so, and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we should have time as well for some questions and discussion. All right, so um, with that, I'm going to introduce Margie Daniels, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to come before you tonight. I, I really have to commend Wakefield and the surrounding towns for coming out 6 o'clock on a Wednesday evening to talk about this important issue. It is really gratifying for those of us who do this type of work in prevention to see so many people sitting here. You have some real true experts in this room who are going to share their wisdom and knowledge with you. I just would like to introduce our organization to you. We are Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth. We are focused on the health and safety of youth. We've been in operation for 31 years, most recently becoming Massachusetts Partnerships for Youth after being Middlesex Partnerships for Youth for so many years. We serve over 125 school districts and other entities in eastern Massachusetts. But the reason I really wanted to get up here tonight is just to say a few words about Senator Lewis. He is such an incredible friend to education and to those of us who work in the prevention field. I'm sure he's well known to so many people here. I saw everyone hugging him and greeting him. And <laughs> He just is, I, I was in public education for 35 years and now in this position for 11, and I have met so many people in my career, and there are few people who are as genuine, sincere, and proactive as Senator Lewis. So I, I really want to salute you for the type of work you've done to keep not only our youth, but all of us safe and healthy. So thank you. <laughs> And just one other comment in case anyone is not aware, that, aware of this, he is the chair of the Joint Education Committee. So as a senator, we are so proud that from this area you are such a leader within the Massachusetts State Senate. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Margie, you're very kind. All right, so without further ado, very excited that we have um, our commissioner of the Department of Public Health, our top public health official in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Commissioner Monica Burrell. Um, it's been a, a, such a pleasure for me when, uh, as the ch chair of the Public Health Committee for a number of years, to work closely with Commissioner Burrell and her team. Um, they, do, they work so incredibly hard on so many important public health issues with limited resources, and they, they really do a great job. They're very dedicated. Um, Dr. Burrell uh, serves as the Commonwealth's uh, chief physician, helps lead our state's um, response to the opioid epidemic, uh, is dedicated to reducing um, health disparities and developing data-driven, evidence-based solutions for keeping people healthy. She was appointed a commissioner of, of DPH by Governor Baker in uh, early 2015. And prior to that uh, was the chief medical officer of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And I know from my own daughter, who was an intern at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, what an amazing organization that is. So when I heard that our new commissioner came from Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, I knew we were in good hands. So with uh, Dr. Commissioner Burrell, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. It's a beautiful day outside, a beautiful evening, and we're all here. 
And we're here because um, we care about this issue. So for a while now, I've been really worried about the vaping epidemic among our youth. And I can tell by this room full of individuals that you are as well. So when Senator Lewis asked me to come and um, talk a little bit about the work we're doing and some of the understandings we have, um, I um, was really happy to join you here and appreciate your advocacy in this area. Um, second, um, when Senator Lewis asked me to do something, I do because he is an unbelievable advocate at the State House and throughout the state for your health and my health. So um, I hope you appreciate that. He's incredibly proactive and really passionate about making sure that we all have opportunities for health in Massachusetts. So we're lucky to have him here. Um, and the third reason I'm here is because I have a 12 and 14 year old, a sixth grader and a ninth grader, and I hear about vaping all the time. So in my um, anecdotal stories that I hear from my children, as some of you may know as well, this is a real issue and it's a real problem and our children and all of us um, need the resources and need to be educated. So I have a few slides to show you so I can give you some visuals. Um, so I just want to take you a little bit on a whirlwind tour of some of the things we're learning about e-cigarettes and vaping and what we're doing at the state level. So first, I want to make sure you know about the Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program. It's a program that sits within the Department of Public Health, and it's been there since 1993. Interesting fact is it was started in 1993 um, because we were able to fund it through a 25 cent tax on um, cigarettes. Um, you'll see the goals of it here around prevention and treatment of individuals using tobacco and nicotine products. Um, this uh, program has really been held up as a national model since the 1990s for how to help prevent and manage tobacco use across the country. And I hope many of you know that cigarette use um, is really low in Massachusetts. There's a very small amount of adults and even smaller amount of children who use cigarettes. And there's lots of efforts in history that I won't talk about today, except to say that most of our tobacco efforts in Massachusetts and the success comes from local communities demanding action and demanding health for themselves and their children. And it's a remarkable history um, that starts, I was glad to hear some of my um, local Board of Health um, colleagues in the room, because it's really been local action across coalitions that has um, made us as healthy as we are here in Massachusetts. Um, but we have a new problem to deal with now. Um, I think all of you know what vaping is, but I wanna just, every time I talk about this, um, um, it, some misnomers come up, and there's a lot of myths about it. The um, visuals you see are pictures of vaping products. This is just some of them. These ones look a little bit more like pens than other products. Um, when people think about vaping, they think about you know water vapor, and I think that's one of the biggest myths I hear from children, I don't know about you, but about um, how these are fun little technology tools um, that have vaporized water in them that are sometimes flavored with things that the senator was talking about, bubble gum, mango, fruit punch, et cetera. Um, so you know, it's really important as we talk about this and think about this to remember that we're talking about inhaled and exhaled aerosolized, that's the name vapor comes from, products, um, there's lots of different names that they go by. Um, sometimes when I'm talking to my kids, um, especially about music they listen to, they trick me with different names and throw out all kinds of things. So I try to make sure we all know the names of things, right? So e-hookahs, e-pipes, mods, vapors, um, the more slang, you know, so many call, kids call, just talk about jewels, right? I'm sure many of you have heard about that. I'm sure many of you know about the new verb, jeweling, unfortunately, bows, blues, and others. So getting comfortable with the language for me has felt really important to be able to talk to teens, and I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that um, as we go forward. Um, so talking a little bit more, you'll see on the right-hand side, that's kind of the basics of our, the packaging of what these are. So there's a battery that's different sizes. Um, the thing in the middle is the aerosolizer, so something that heats the liquid, right, to vaporize it and aerosolize it. Um, and then the um, pod and then a mouthpiece. The, thing, the important thing about the pod is that sometimes it comes with the device, but many times you're buying replacement pods. And one of the most important things that I find um, helpful to individuals when they're thinking about the risks of this is that one of those pods has as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes, right? So it's this tiny little device um, that has a lot of nicotine in it. Um, 
sometimes we focus on the nicotine. I really want to make sure that we understand that these are relatively new. There are these ultra fine particles. And the reason the ultra fine is important because the smaller the particle is, the easier it is as we inhale it for it to um, embed itself in our lungs. The long-term effects of this um, are debatable because they haven't been around long enough. However, we do know they contain ingredients that we know are dangerous to human health. Things like um, diacetyl, which is a chemical that's already been linked to lung disease, carcinogenics or cancer-causing cancer chemicals, and heavy metals. So even if you take the nicotine issue out of this, there are other ingredients in this that are, are vaporized that we know can be um, dangerous to humans. So focusing for a little bit, um, I called this a public health epidemic among youth. The senator called this a public health epidemic. Maybe you would call it that as well. Let's just look at the numbers for a second about why. Um, so nationally, we know that um, between 2017 and 2018, 1 1.5 million youth picked up e-cigarettes, right? So think, you just think about that. Um, and these numbers in particular really are my personal call to action. When you look at the national numbers, you'll see that um, in 2018, one in five, right, so that's a lot, of high schoolers said they've used e-cigarettes in the last month. But look at the number in 2011, and you'll see it was only 1.5. So this is on a rapid, rapid upward course. And we'll talk about why that might be in a minute. And even in middle schoolers, right, so these are our youngest um, even preteens are being exposed with coming from 0.6, so barely anybody using them in 2011, up to 4.9. And, you know, it may feel mysterious about how these have come about, but make no mistake about it, this is purposeful marketing and targeting of our children in order to develop another, po uh, another generation of individuals who are addicted to nicotine. And that's a really important point for all of us to understand. Um, I gave you the national numbers. I want to make sure you understand the, unfortunately, the Massachusetts numbers are, are, are close. So if you look at our numbers in 2017, you'll see that 41% of high schoolers reported using e-cigarettes. 41%, that's almost half, right? It feels like that, having a high school. They talk a lot about people having tried it. And of those, 20% are using them regularly and up to 10% of middle schoolers. So this is the reason we're calling it this epidemic, this really big rise, and just unbelievable number of children using this. And most importantly, many of them not being aware of the risks and the um, health impacts on themselves, both short and long term. So I talked a little bit about the dangers of e-cigarettes. Um, this comes up a lot around the FDA regulations. I, too, was hopeful that there may have been um, some change coming from the FDA. I'm not sure now what will happen with the change of leadership that will be happening there. Um, but do know, again, that these um, devices do contain nicotine and other harmful ingredients. It's really important to understand. And nicotine is highly addictive. And because these products are relatively new, we do not know the long-term effects of them. Remember that they were originally designed to be harm reduction devices for adults who smoke regular cigarettes. We know that if you smoke a regular cigarette, right? So I'm talking about a combustion, I'll just call it a regular cigarette. One out of every two people die from the health consequences of it. So 50% of people who smoke die because of that cigarette. So therefore, if you could transfer them over to a device where you know you're removing some of the carcinogenic and dangerous ingredients in that, why wouldn't you do that? That is the only way in which e-cigarettes might be helpful. And that's in adults. It's really never been looked at in children. The other important thing about that is that there are some studies suggesting it. You might get confused by hearing about people quoting studies because um, it was confusing for me. Um, there's evidence on both sides, and it's not even quite clear for adults. It really gets them away from um, regular combustible cigarettes. Um, but that was the original design. Um, but the way that they're marketed and the way that they are now being used is by our youth. And that's really important. So again, the risks are specific to youth. So nicotine in and of itself, even if it didn't have those other ingredients in it, is damaging for the developing brain. All of our brains develop up into at least the mid-20s. And that's why when you talk about any addiction and we think about, uh, you know, we do a lot of work in public health about trying to decrease exposures for youth to any addictive product. And the reason is because our brains develop up into the 20s. And we know that most of us 
who become addicted to something become addicted to something before the age of 18. So the longer that we can protect our youth and we can protect the brains of our youth, the better it is for them. So delaying, delaying, delaying. Many youth, again, aren't realizing that there's nicotine in this. Um, one important thing, you know, we, we, I, I was just talking to someone this afternoon about the increase in anxiety, depression, impulse control, and those issues that we're seeing in our high school, as many of you are nodding, so I know you see that as well. And unfortunately, um, nicotine affects the same parts of the brain that work in those areas. So all of these things that we're seeing, you know, sometimes kids with anxiety will say, maybe I should use this because it might help me, and it actually makes the symptoms worse or can help trigger some of these things that may not have otherwise come out. So that's really important. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing, remember I told you how there's so much nicotine um, in each one of those pods? Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that children are becoming addicted to the nicotine. It's highly addictive. People say it's one of the hardest things to stop. And then when we're asking them to stop or punitively you know, punishing them if they're found in school with these products, because they're addicted to it, it's hard. And I must tell you that there are not that many pediatricians or doctors who take care of kids who actually have had to deal with how do you um, transition someone off of nicotine when at that level. Um, or most of our experiences with adults using things like gums and patches and the medication. So we're really in this tricky area where they start, it becomes really, really difficult to then treat as well. I talked a little bit about the marketing. The senator talked about the marketing. Um, there's a couple of things that appeal to young people. Um, price is a big issue. So the cheaper they are, these things are really cheap. Accessibility, right? Locally available everywhere. I remember when they first came out and I didn't know what they are. I thought they were candy. My son was you know, eight or nine at the time, picked it up as if it was bubble gum or something, right? So the packaging, the accessibility, the price, the way the packages are designed, um, and the flavors. The advertising, if you look at your, um, those of you who are involved with children, if you look at their social media and targeting of it, it's really targeted in youth-friendly social media sites to be able to really engage um, children. So um, one of the things when I talk to youth, I talk about um, getting them angry and outraged about the marketing that's being done to make a profit at their expense. And um, that's something I think really important for us to talk with our youth about, and I don't know if it resonates with all youth, but um, it's a fact that it's happening. Um, this is just one example. This is a study um, looking at e-cigarettes, advertising, and rise of use. I'm not saying this is causational, but this is the association the increased use of e-cigarettes and the increased advertising, right? So the impact of advertising, which has been studied, by the way, especially relates relating to flavors. And I see a couple of people taking um, photos, and I'm happy to also provide this to the senator's office, any of these slides. So let's talk for a second about what we're doing. Um, one of our main um, ways to approach e-cigarette Vaping is to work with our youth. There are a lot of youth, you'll hear from some of them soon, who are really equally as outraged, as scared for themselves and their friends and want to take action. Um, and then also, um, the other way is for us here together as we are as adults catching up because we are behind in this um, and need to educate ourselves and be informed and help our children um, understand what these products are. Um, you heard already from the senator here. Senator, I don't know if you knew I had this photo of you and myself with the governor, because we were two of the proudest people on those days. This is my um, fifth year at the Department of Public Health, and this is one of my proudest moments. And we were both beaming. We were like children in a candy store or something. Um, but um, this is really important. We were, I think, the sixth state to take on tobacco to raise the age to 21, right? So it's about that access issue and about allowing the brain to develop for longer. Um, and this is important. And one of the important things that the senator mentioned that I want to reiterate is our smoke-free laws, which, by the way, are really, really strong in Massachusetts. And when you then apply them to vaping and e-cigarettes, a lot of folks from the education world have told me that's really helped them because then they can apply those same rules and policies to the schools, right, which has really helped in that part. Um, and I must say, um, the senator mentioned about going further and um, restricting flavors, which is a huge issue for youth access. Um, and, you know, you should be proud that 142 cities and towns throughout Massachusetts Massachusetts have already restricted these um, flavors, and um, I'm hoping the state will follow. I talked about awareness. I want to make sure you know about this campaign. You can just Google Get, Get Outraged, and you'll see it, but I'll, sh I'll, I'll share the website with you later. 
This is about giving information to parents and teachers. So what you can find at this site is a way to, you know, general advice on how to start talking to children about this. Um, children I talk to are not quite clear that their parents think it's a bad idea or that it's dangerous to them in some way. So how, how to kind of start that dialogue and talk to our kids and even how to recognize them. I showed you some photos, but Look at all those on the right-hand side. So these ones that look like USBs, I know teachers I talk to, especially in the beginning of the epidemic, we're just not recognizing these um, devices. So really getting educated ourselves. And there's a um, button on here for schools. And we have a toolkit that has resources and materials, including um, um, you know, model policies that can be put into place. <clears throat> and then talking about youth, um, this is our campaign. Um, I think you see there's a poster of it in the back as well. Look at that, there's like props in the back. But um, this is talking about, this, is, this came from our youth, the 84 movement, which is the youth anti-smoking advocates and others came together and talked to us about what would work for them and their um, peers about really getting this out on Instagram, Snapchat, all these other sites so that um, kids are educating and being really a push against um, the um, tobacco industry. There's a lot of other stuff we're doing. Uh, to point out a couple of things to you, um, we um, sent letters to the school superintendents. If you're involved in your school systems, ask them about it. We ask them to share them with the um, PTOs and other community members because it has links to those toolkits and stuff. So um, the pediatrician piece, we're trying to do some education with our colleagues at Mass Medical to help with that piece. Um, we're funding local communities where I mentioned already this starts. Um, and we're, um, of course, making the helpline and quit works referral programs available, but there is an issue there. Um, with youth that is a gap. Um, in addition to public presentations like this, we have published through the department letters to the editor, opinion pieces. I urge you to share them when you see them. Write your own pieces. Share this information on social media. A lot of the tactics that are being used to get to our youth and really give us myths and misinformation, we have to then counter with the right information. Um, that is the site, getoutraged.org, um, um, if you want to go and look at some of those materials. Um, I need to give a shout out to our youth um, this is um, on Kick Butts Day, which is this unbelievable event where the 84 movement um, kids come and advocate for their health at the State House as it relates to tobacco issues. Um, and they are the real leaders in this and the real ones who are inspiring us. Um, and the more youth we can get engaged in this, right, to make the norm not to use e-cigarettes, vape products, not to try them just to have the experience because of how addictive they are the um, better it is. I didn't mention when I was talking about the risks, um, the use of things such as marijuana in them, the use of um, how it leads. There is evidence about it potentiating the brain for um, other addictions such as opiates, marijuana, and others. So that's important to remember. If you have young people in your life, if you can um, encourage them to join an 84 movement or to at least follow them on social media to help share the message. Um, these are just some of the um, things that we're doing. If you connect with us at the department, you'll see some of the other work we are doing. Um, but it's going to take all of us. This is really a huge issue. I am personally very concerned about this for our youth. Um, and the reason I'm here today is I am looking forward to working with you together um, because it's going to take all of us to make sure we get ahead of this epidemic. Thank you for having me here today. Wow, thank you so much, Commissioner. That was fantastic. And um, I can tell you all from personal experience, the 84-day um, the, um, Kick Butts Day is one of the most exciting days of the year at the State House when we have all these students coming and uh, really just um, speaking up for themselves. And having student voices is part of this conversation and other issues that, that young people advocate on, climate change, civics, all kinds of things, really is very powerful. The Get Outrage campaign, I think it's great. So I really want to encourage everyone here tonight and everyone who's going to watch this um, program later to check it out and, and share the information. You know, share it with your friends. The link is out. Um, please get this out. That's the, probably the most important thing from tonight is share this great information, the tools we have with friends, neighbors, colleagues, particularly, again, parents and, and with kids. Um, all right, so next up, we're very uh, pleased to have Elise uh, Yannett with us um, from the uh, Office of the Attorney General. And um, I just have to say, um, you know, our Attorney General, Maura Healy, is, is tremendous on so many issues, and she's fighting uh, to protect us on many fronts. 
but um, I was so impressed um, when I first became a state senator. You know, we didn't have anything dealing with vaping products at that time. There was no, they weren't defined in state law. We didn't have, there was no legal age. You literally, under state law, could sell an e-cigarette to a five-year-old. And the Attorney General recognized this immediately when she just became Attorney General and immediately acted to pass regulations under her, I think it's under her Consumer Protection uh, Authority, to pass regulations to at least make sure that you couldn't sell them to anyone under 18. And also the packaging had to be childproof and, and took these other steps very quietly, just got it done. And that was part of what educated me and then inspired me to say, boy, you know, well, this is a big issue. We, we need to start working on this uh, in, in the legislature and, and have a permanent solution. So um, very pleased to welcome Elise tonight. She is a policy coordinator um, in the Policy and Government Division of uh, the Office of the Attorney General. She's worked there for the past five years. Um, she helps to develop and advance Attorney General Maura Healy's policy and legislative priorities, and she collaborates with um, other government agencies, elected officials all across the Commonwealth on these policies. She has been the leader on the Attorney General's work on e-cigarettes and vaping, um, and she also leads the Attorney General's um, Innovative Substance Use Prevention Education Initiative, which some of you may be familiar with, which is called Project Here. And that's a great project dealing with addiction prevention in general. Um, so please join me in welcoming Elise Yannett. Hi, good evening. Um, I just want to start by saying a couple quick thank yous. Um, first, of course, thank you to the Senator for having me for your leadership um, on public health uh, just in general and on Tobacco 21. I know that was a fight for a number of years um, and, and you put so much work into that and that was such an important victory um, for our state. I want to thank the commissioner for her leadership. I know members of her team are here as well um, for their work to address vaping and they've been really great to collaborate with on this issue. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to the youth who are here because I, as has been mentioned, their voices in this are, I think, the most important. Um, and for them to stand up and say, this is not okay, you cannot target us, um, and we're not gonna fall for your marketing practices is really powerful. And I've heard a couple of them speak across the state and they do a better job than me every time. <laughs> um, and lastly, I want to give a special thank you to uh, Maureen Busby, who um, is I've come to know over the last year and to me is the definition of a public servant. Uh, for those of you from this area, she is out there at all hours of the day, even on weekends, um, doing compliance checks of local tobacco retailers. Um, and she's a total rock star, so you guys are really lucky to have her. <laughs> Um, so for those of you that don't know, the Attorney General's office is the chief law enforcement officer in the Commonwealth, and our job is to enforce state laws to keep residents safe. Um, and vaping over the last about year and a half has really become a priority for our office. Um, to us, this is about protecting the health and well-being of our youth and to prevent another generation, a new generation, from growing up addicted to nicotine. Um, and vaping is now the number one issue um, right up there with the opioid epidemic that the Attorney General hears about when she's going um, to different events across the state. And as the Senator said, it's everywhere from the Cape to the Berkshires in rural, urban, suburban communities. Um, the commissioner touched on this, so I'll uh, sort of skim over some of my um, points, but you know, almost half of high schoolers in Massachusetts have um, tried vaping, and between one in four, one in five um, vapes regularly. And the Surgeon General and the CDC um, just found, as, as the commissioner had alluded to, between 2017 and 2018 alone, um, e-cigarette use among high school students nationally rose 75% and among middle school students rose 50%. And we're definitely seeing that here across the state. Um, one school official told me um, that last year alone, uh, they confiscated more than 200 devices uh, from students at school, um, including from some students as young as fourth grade. Um, another superintendent um, uh, told me and the attorney general that his high school students now refer to the school bathroom as the jewel lounge. 
Um, and some schools are, have even hired extra hall monitors um, to help deal and try to get a handle on this vaping epidemic. Um, one school nurse estimated that almost 80% of her high school students are vaping. Um, and it's not just parents and teachers we hear it from, it's students. Um, we went to a school on the North Shore, visited with a middle school class, and uh, it was about 20 of them, 12 and 13 year olds. Um, and the teacher asked them, how many of you know someone that vapes? And every single hand in that class went up. And the teacher, I mean, excuse me, the students went on to share with us that they have friends who they know as 12, 13, 12 and 13 year olds um, could not quit if they wanted to because they're addicted. Um, and we're hearing the same from parents. You know, I've had very um, just emotional phone calls with parents who have reached out, um, you know, whose children are addicted to nicotine from these vaping products. Um, their children's academic and athletic performances are suffering. Um, students that are otherwise, you know, uh, top athletes and top students um, and young people have experienced some pretty severe um, withdrawal symptoms, as the commissioner mentioned, um, when they attempt to quit. Um, and we've even heard from pediatricians who are seeing and treating increasing numbers of young people with nicotine addiction or trying to. Um, one pediatrician uh, told us that he is a patient that's so addicted she has to sleep with her jewel under her pillow because she can't get through the night without taking a hit. Um, and so, you know, some of you may be wondering, though I hope from the commissioners and from the senator's remarks you um, uh, you know, are understand or already understand why this is such a big deal. Um, because one of those tiny cartridges contains as much nicotine as a whole pack of cigarettes. You know, and the way they're designed, it, um, you know, they've been sort of chemically engineered so that it doesn't have the same harsh hit on the throat as with a combustible cigarette. So kids are able to go through a pod, two pods in a day because they're not, their throats are not burning, you know, when they're inhaling. Um, and the nicotine concentrations in Juul Pods and many of these other products are so high that they're actually banned in the European Union because they consider them toxic. Um, and as you know, the commissioner said, um, nicotine is a very addictive substance, and it shouldn't be anywhere near the brains or bodies of uh, developing um, the developing brains or bodies of young people. And many students have no idea; they think it's just water vaporing and bubble gum or cotton candy flavoring. Um, a survey by the Truth Initiative showed that two thirds of young people have no idea that there's nicotine in these products. Um, and I just want to make clear where we stand, just because something is legal for adults does not mean that it's safe for anyone, um, but especially for kids. Um, as many of you may remember, a generation ago, the major cigarette companies made a fortune uh, by following a simple strategy, get them hooked while they're young. And when cigarettes first came out, uh, the long-term health consequences weren't established. People thought that they were safe to use. Um, and using mascots and clever advertisements, they got tens of millions of smokers addicted um, while they were children, leading to probably the biggest public health disaster our country has seen. And for the past 50 years, local advocates, attorneys generals, the public health community have fought really hard to reduce cigarette use and protect our young people and hold big tobacco accountable. Um, and thanks to those efforts, as has been mentioned, the smoking of combustible cigarettes is at an all-time low. It has been in the single digits. Um, but all of that progress is at risk because of the vaping industry. I think... <laughs> it, is, it is so. <laughs> um, uh, um, you know, I think most concerning from our office, you know, who, who was part of the master settlement agreement, who went after Big Tobacco, we're seeing the same marketing and advertising tactics that Big Tobacco used. Um, you know, vaping manufacturers um, often claim that their goal is to provide an alternative for adult cigarette smokers. 
but that's not why we're here. That's not why um, youth in Massachusetts are using e-cigarettes at a rate nine times that of adults. And thank you to DPH for that statistic. Um, uh, we're here because companies are selling liquid nicotine in flavors that smell and taste like Sour Patch Kids, Bubblegum, Swedish Fish, and literally thousands more, making cases like the kind you put on your cell phone with designs of comic book characters and cartoons like Captain America and SpongeBob. Um, creating sleek small devices that can fit in the palm of a hand and look like USB drives. Um, and then there are the advertising methods, using bright colors, young attractive models to make vaping look cool, and advertising on social media platforms that youth often use like Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. So here's what the Attorney General's office is doing and is, will continue to do. Um, first, as uh, folks have mentioned education is key and we're going to continue to invest in prevention education we're going to continue our focus on project here our office's free substance use prevention education program available to all middle schools across the state uh, we're now in over 300 schools and we're dedicated to making sure that schools and students have the tools they need um, to be healthy and avoid substances um, second, last year we sent a letter to every public school district in Massachusetts to express our concerns about vaping um, and to offer our support to them. Um, at that time, uh, we learned that Jewel had been reaching out directly to schools, um, offering schools to pilot their own quote unquote prevention program, um, and they were offering schools monetary compensation to do so. Uh, which is another chapter out of the Big Tobacco Playbook. Um, so in our letter, we warned schools about these efforts and we provided them with a list of alternative trusted prevention resources. Uh, third, the Attorney General just a few weeks ago um, has announced her support for new laws, calling for new laws to treat vaping products like other tobacco products. We support banning flavors and taxing e-cigarette products. We've been pleased that both the governor's budget and the Senate budget um, have included provisions to tax these products and importantly license these retailers. Um, and we know that flavors target kids. Um, and our response to e-cigarettes should be the same as the effective response we had for traditional cigarettes. Unfortunately, we've been through this once before, um, but that means we know what works. Fourth, we launched an investigation into Juul Labs. We were the first attorney general's office in the country to do so. Juul now accounts for 75% of a $2 billion e-cigarette market. And Altria, which you may know by their former name, Philip Morris, uh, recently invested $12 billion into Juul. Uh, so we're investigating them uh, for deceptive sales and marketing practices and asking some serious questions about how they're doing business. Are they tracking underage use of the products? What are they doing about the rampant use of their products by teenagers? And was this an intentional outcome of their own design and efforts? Our families and all of you deserve answers to these questions, and we're going to get them. Uh, and fifth, we have sent cease and desist letters to and shut down online retailers who have been violating state law. Uh, I will give you uh, one example. Um, earlier this year, just a few months ago, our office heard from a high school student who was looking up her, I believe it was 10th grade algebra assignment on her homework app, an app that's used by teachers and students in grades K through 12. Uh, and when she was looking up her algebra advertisement, on one side of the screen is her algebra assignment, and on the other side of the screen was a huge vaping advertisement. And when we went to that website, they had absolutely no age verification. Um, so we've shut down this online retailer and others who have no age verification, making these products really easily accessible to minors. And we're gonna continue to investigate these online retailers and take a look at brick and mortars. And we're gonna continue to hold those that violate the law accountable. I want to wrap up by just reiterating that our office is committed to addressing this issue and we're committed to working together with federal, state, local government, the legislature, the public health community, and all of you. Um, as folks have said, it's really going to take all of us to address this. Um, and we all have a really important role to play. Um, to parents, please make sure your kids understand the real risks of vaping and have an open and honest conversation. 
um, ask them by what they're seeing, ask them about what they're seeing and what they know about these products. And DPH has really great res resources to help guide and give you some tips about how to start that conversation. And know that if your child is vaping, they may not be able to quit on their own. So please seek medical advice, whether from a pediatrician or an addiction specialist. Um, and to school officials and community leaders, as has been said, the best strategy is to stop addiction before it starts and to get everyone educated and aware. Uh, and to everyone, if you are aware of um, local stores or websites that are selling or marketing these products to youth, um, you can file a complaint with your Board of Health, but you can also file a complaint with our office. Um, we will look into it and are taking these seriously. Um, and just last but not least, thank you guys for spending your evening for coming together um, to educate yourselves and learn more about this really important issue. Thank you so much, Elise. and, and uh, our Attorney General for the incredible work that you're doing. You know, we, it can be depressing that we're facing this epidemic and these statistics are overwhelming, but at least the good news is we're fighting back. Um, and that's, that's how we're gonna win this battle. So, um, you know, what we're doing through the, the Department of Public Health, through the Attorney General's office, through our local efforts, you know, we are not taking this lying down. We are fighting back against these predatory companies uh, like Juul and others that are targeting our kids. Um, so next up, um, we, she doesn't need an introduction at this point. Um, we have Maureen Busby, and as everyone knows, Maureen's our local uh, tobacco, regional tobacco prevention coordinator and leads the efforts in our, in our region around tobacco control, um, works with our local boards of health, with our schools, communities, and retailers, and we're thrilled that she's joined tonight by uh, two students, um, Logan, who's a sophomore at Wakefield High School, and Elena as a freshman, right, at Wakefield High School. So thank you so much for being with us. We're eagerly anticipating what you have to share with us. And so I'm going to hand it over. Maureen, are you going to go first? Okay. I'll hand it over to Maureen. Thank you all. Um, thank you to Senator Lewis's office for organizing this community conversation. Thank you to Commissioner Burrell and to Lise Yannick for joining us. And thank you to all of you who came out this evening to engage in this important discussion. We all know it is our collective responsibility to protect youth from harmful substances like alcohol, nicotine, and other drugs. We all know by now um, all the stats around smoking. Smoking rates are way down. Thanks in part to the tobacco prevention advocates, some of you are in this room, who have worked on this subject for decades. Uh, way before my time. I'm a relative, <laughs> I mean not, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> way before my time in public health. <laughs> Let me clarify. <laughs> um, I'm a relative newcomer to public health, so I can't take any credit for the decline in smoking rates. Unfortunately, as we've heard already tonight, while smoking rates are at historic lows, vaping rates are at epidemic levels, which is why we're here. Um, but before I get into what I've been charged with discussing with you tonight, which is what's happening on the street, and I will get to that, I want to tell a story that highlights the amazing collaboration among our local substance use prevention groups, the kind of collaboration that I believe is critical if we are to be successful in our prevention efforts. Catherine Dingra, who's here tonight, director of Wake Up, um, decided, to, which is Wakefield's Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition, decided to apply for one of the workshop slots at this year's CADCA con uh, conference. We called it From Jeweling in the Bathroom to T21, How Youth Engagement Led to State Law. Our proposal was accepted and I flew down to DC in early February with Billy Stevens, a Wakefield High School senior, to meet up with Catherine to present at this prestigious national conference which attracts 3,000 substance use prevention advocates from across the nation. Catherine, Billy, and I all presented in person and Senator Lewis, who couldn't be there that day, presented virtually. I wanna read from the conference evaluation report that we received after the conference, quote, Respondents were very satisfied with this session. 100% thought that this session should be repeated at the next conference, and that the information they received will be easy for them to implement in their own coalitions. One respondent noted that, hearing from their state senator 
was also impressive. Respondents agreed uh, presenters demonstrated expertise in the subject matter, captured their attention, and that the information was easy to understand. Several respondents praised the youth presenter in particular. So that's why it's so important for our youth to be with us tonight. They, they always have a vo voice that, is, um, that people are happy to hear from. While this trip was made possible by collaboration with funding from the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, thank you guys, some of you in the room, my tobacco prevention work is funded by MTCP, Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention, as we've heard, a division of DPH. That is a long way to say, thank you, Commissioner Burrell, <laughs> for understanding the needs of our communities and making sure that we have funding to continue the critical work of youth nicotine addiction prevention. And thank you to Senator Lewis, Rep. Wong, Rep. Broder, and all the other state legislators who support substance use prevention. Um, now, uh, what am I seeing on the street, literally on the street? First, in our retail establishments, more family-friendly stores, that's convenience stores, gas station, mini-marts, and liquor stores, stores that minors can enter, are carrying vaping products, and almost exclusively the Jewel brand. Stores that traditionally sold cigarettes only, and I have several of them in my region, in many cases now also sell jewels. Pretty much a sea change in what I see on, on store shelves. Dab pens, um, we see in, um, in, that we've heard about tonight already, but um, what I want to mention is an adult-only store, smoke, that's smoke shops, tobacconists, vape shops, stores that are age-restricted. You have to be 21 or older to enter. Um, and they've grown dramatically, by the way, in the past few years. Um, several in this community, there are three right on one street. These stores have a huge variety of products, jewels of course, everybody has those, but other brands as well, with new ones popping up all the time. And there are these vape devices called dab pens and other marijuana accessories. For the uninitiated, a dab pen is used for vaping liquid nicotine and can be easily mistaken, I mean, for liquid THC, and can be easily mistaken for a nicotine delivery device. So when you see one of these, you don't necessarily know what's in it. You might think it's a nicotine delivery device, and it could be, or it might be that um, it has liquid THC. My colleague, Diane Knight, in the back of the room, thank you, Diane, has examples of some of the products that are popular among our youth. Be sure to stop at her table before you leave tonight because she, she can show you some of the um, intriguing and interesting designs that our, the manufacturers are, are promoting. Now, what's going on in our schools? I've received many, many calls from school administrators asking for assistance with increasing youth use in their schools. Students caught with vape devices, caught using, caught selling, and then the resulting consequences which can reach the level of school suspension. We've discussed the need for policies that address student vaping, health education, development of diversion programs, and especially the critical need for treatment programs. Um, this particular slide shows vape products that were confiscated in a local school over a two-month period last spring. My colleagues and I have also participated in parent meetings, conducted workshops for teachers, coaches, school nurses, and other staff members, and met with numerous community groups. It's so important, as other folks have mentioned tonight, that everyone be educated about these new addictive products. Um, now a little bit about the complaint calls that I've received. I've received more complaint calls in the last few months than I received in the last seven years combined. I'll share the gist of a few of those calls as I think it can help paint a picture of what we're experiencing in our local communities, meaning the communities that I work in. Although, what's happening here locally is happening across the state and across the nation. One resident called the local board of health to report that she knew that a certain store was selling to her teenage son. She had the receipts. A member of a local coalition emailed that one of her clients told her that a certain store was selling to middle school kids this store is right across the street from a middle school, and that you would be sold to if you had a card. The police department in the same community reported that teens were being sold to if they used a certain code phrase. A friend messaged me on Facebook that her son said, everyone knows that such and such store sells, meaning sells to kids. 
A mom called her local community's health department to report that her teenage son took an Uber to a neighboring community to buy vape products. That's how she discovered her son's vaping habit on her Uber account charges. A parent reported seeing more than the usual, she said more than the usual, after school snack charges on her son's debit card, which is attached to her account. Members of the Medford Police Department have called with reports they've received about certain stores allegedly selling to minors. A middle school principal called to report a store where a student in his school purchased a vape device which he had confiscated. In all of these instances, these establishments were subject to an extra compliance check and a compliance check is when I take a trained youth to a local establishment that sells tobacco and, uh, products and I supervise as the youth enters the store and seeks to buy a tobacco or nicotine product. In one, special, uh, one such special targeted um, check, four out of the nine stores that we checked that evening sold. And I believe that that non-compliant rate is actually even higher. Because if they're selling to our youth, the, the youth buyer in our program, then they're surely selling to their regular underage customers, the local youth that they know are okay. Um, I've actually been standing in an adult store, Elise can attest to this, when a youth, or more than one youth, entered, spotted adult customers, and bolted. Not proof that will stand up in court, but pretty good evidence to me that these kids, right after school, backpacks and all, close to a high school, knew what to do if a strange adult was in the store. I've heard from numerous concerned parents wondering how to tell if their teen is vaping and if they are addicted and what to do if their teen is addicted. If you have that same concern, certainly as we've heard tonight, talk to the school nurse, definitely talk to your child's pediatrician, and again, there are a number of online resources, including our own website, which has been mentioned, getoutrage.org, as well as you might want to check out the truthinitiative.org. The Tr Truth Initiative recently launched a text tip line, one track for parents and one for youth who want to try to quit vaping. And then there's additional resource information on the table in the, in the back. Thank you again, Diane. Um, and a few words about withdrawal, this has already been mentioned, but withdrawing from cigarette smoking is very tough for an adult smoker. Withdrawing from nicotine for an adolescent can be absolutely miserable with, with um, all the symptoms that an adult can have when they're trying to withdraw from smoking. But imagine this with a, with a teenager who's got all the other stresses in their life, school, SATs, trying to get into college, trying to stay on a team, whatever it might, might be that's going on in their, in their lives. And so my, re my request to you is please be informed as we are tonight, be patient, be supportive, and get help and know that your teen may, be, may need um, professional medical help. Now, next slide. Um, now, as bleak as all this sounds, I do want to say that we know that not all kids are, are vaping. Some students are active in their communities in all sorts of positive ways. For instance, students from the Galvin Middle School right next door participated in a recent Earth Day cleanup at Lake Quanapowit. After the cleanup, the trash was sorted and a volunteer very thoughtfully captured the image that you see on the screen. This is a trash bag full of empty jewel pods. When a, when a jewel pod is used up, when the vapor has finished the liquid in that pod, they simply throw away the old pod and replace it with a new one. This is the new cigarette butt, but even less biodegradable. And now we're gonna take a few minutes to hear from our students Elena Greco and uh, Logan Cosgrove, as, as we know, Wakefield High School students, who are members of the Wakefield Youth Action Team, and they'll share a bit about what they're experiencing in their schools, in their communities, um, you know, among their friends and acquaintances, and then we'll take questions. Do you wanna stand up here by the microphone? Would that be easier? Do you wanna, yeah, come, whatever whichever you want. you want, whatever you want. <laughs> Hi everyone, so um, we are both leaders of the Youth Action Team, which you might not know what it is, but it's a group of diverse teens throughout the school, both the middle school and the high school, and our main goal is like positive influence in the community. Um, so some of the things that we have done recently include going into 
different convenience stores and checking for drug paraphernalia, which coincides with the flavor ban. We created a, multiple vaping PSAs and one of them was on the whiteboard. I don't know if you've seen them or not. You should definitely check them out. They're really good and show them around. And they show how easy it is for someone to just like buy a vape online. We have these different um, like newsletter type things in the middle in the high school and they go up in the bathrooms and you hang them up. So we use different data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and we put in data about how not everyone is vaping but how there are some statistics that people are. Uh, annually we attend Kick Butts Day which you've heard someone about it. It's at the State House and we go and talk to representatives and like Senator Lewis. <laughs> um, <laughs> We go into health classes in the fall and the spring, and we uh, have like a Jeopardy game, so they get to learn all about the different like school rules regarding vaping, what's going on in the community, what's going on in the state, and it's really helpful. They really learn a lot, and it's a good interactive way to get them involved. We have surveys that we do, like the Mint and Methyl survey, um, and the new campaign, like the one in the back, that's currently what we're trying to um, institute into the school and get the message spread around. So some of the things that I have seen are not too pretty, but um, like every day I walk down my brother parks. I don't know how familiar you are with Wakefield High School, but there's a parking lot up the hill. And I walk down the hill, it's like a five minute walk. And the amount of just empty jewel pods I see is disgusting. It's everywhere. They're all in the grass and they're all on the sidewalk. And it's like, really? Like why? But it's everywhere and clearly people are using them. And then just last week, my friend went to the bathroom during lunch and he came back and his hands were like soaking wet. And I'm like, why are your hands wet? Were there not any paper towels? And he's like, no, I couldn't use the paper towels. There were two people vaping in the way. Mm -hmm. So it's right in the bathroom, but not just in the bathroom. It's clearly along the sidewalk on the hill and among other places. Uh, uh, as stated earlier, I'm Elena Greco, and I'm a freshman at Wakefield Memorial High School. I'm a youth action team leader, and I have only been a youth action team leader for a short time, but um, I have seen being a freshman, and even being in eighth grade, I've experienced a lot of, I've seen uh, vaping and juuling affect my school community, and I have some stories from what I've seen um, in the community. Um, the first one, I knew this student who was considered a good student. They got good grades, A's, did extracurriculars, things like that. But I heard them talk a lot about how they had an addiction to nicotine. They used vaping products a lot. And they started to complain about this problem. They stopped being able to do their homework because using the Juul gave them such a headache that they weren't even able to do their homework. And they kept asking, like, do you guys think I should quit? And be able to do my homework and they considered quitting but decided not to because they were so addicted to the device that they couldn't handle quitting they decided to just let their grades decline and keep this headache instead of actually quitting and being able to do their homework and despite complaining about this the culture in the school and in my grade it was so accepted and almost normal to jewel that the next week as a gift to them, I saw multiple people give them vaping devices as a gift, which is awful. And the person still continues to jewel despite the effect on their grades, which is awful. Um, another story or thing I'm seeing a lot is vaping in classes, um, especially during gym classes, uh, not gym classes, but like classes outdoors, um, kids can seem to get farther away so teachers can't see them um, using the devices in classes when teachers leave for only a brief moment, kids seem to use it. 
it's it's sad that kids are risking getting suspended for several days on end just to fuel their addiction. It's it's sad to see because some of these kids are good kids. They they want to do well in school. They want to do extracurriculars. They want to be seen as a good kid, but have this addiction. Um, this third uh, testimonial for me. Um, I've seen kids get hooked over and over and over again. I've seen several, like, I've seen firsthand accounts of kids saying, this is bad for me, I know it's bad for me, and trying to stop and trying to quit, but we live in such a culture, in the school especially I go to, where it's so hard to quit. You see people using it in the bathroom, and, and you have to take the strength of your youth mind to try and say no, no, but it's so hard when you're addicted to the substance to just stop when you can easily go and buy another device or buy more pods for your device. It's just heartbreaking because it, they want to quit. They, there are kids out there who want to quit, but it's just so hard right now to be able to quit. Especially, I feel like this um, juuling and use substance abuse problem in the high schools has to correlate with I've seen an increase in mental health, uh, anxiety, depression. Kids are not using the coping mechanisms, sports and other things like that. They're using juuling and using marijuana instead of getting the help they need and it's sad because I've seen incredibly intelligent students who have anxiety and depression and deal with these mental health issues and are stressed because of school turn to drooling and dab pens and things like that to cope with this stress instead of reaching out to someone. It's just a sad thing to see and I really hope we can fix this problem in our community. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Logan. Um, thank you, Maureen. Um, thank you for so, such thoughtful, insightful comments. And thanks for being such great role models for your yeah. fellow peers. Um, so we are going to try to wrap up around 8, but um, we probably have time for, for a couple questions or feedback for any of us, um, either around anything we've talked about. So. Charlie, you want to go first? So we don't have a microphone, but just stand up and just speak as loudly as you can so we, everyone can hear you. So uh, thank you guys for doing this. Um, the reason I actually, I actually worked for the center last uh, summer, and I was in the office when I was in the office when I was in the office. So I was in the office. So I go to school down at American University in the same sophomore, but I went to, I graduated from really high um, in 2017. And unfortunately, my buddy, Matt Murphy, who could not be here tonight, but there was a New York Times article about him. Yeah, and he said he said he made one of the biggest points about how he was had a real problem with Julian, and how one of the biggest struggles for him was being able to realize that his parents and his peers were on his, were his allies. And how getting help is a sign of strength, not weakness. And I think the other part of the problem is that why kids don't get help is because they're afraid of how they'll be judged. And you mentioned how kids are getting suspended. I'm not suggesting we get away with that, but we tend to, whenever someone has a problem with this, we tend to crack down and suspend or we punish. We don't find ways to come. How do we make it so that it's a real, it's a legitimate thing socially where getting help is a sign of strength, not a weakness? How do we create that? Great. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Commissioner, do you want to comment at all? Because there's been a lot of work the departments are doing around destigmatizing. Mm -hmm mental health and, and addiction treatment in general, not just vaping, but sure. maybe comment on that. I don't think I could have said it better than yeah. you did, but um, I think that um, as the students said, um, you know, this is not the norm, it doesn't have to be, but if somebody um, is using these products, how can we as our community come and wrap ourselves around them in mm -hmm. a way that is helpful to them? So I think that's a great point around the stigma issue. We're doing a lot of work in that. So. Um, I think that's going to be a really powerful part of our solution. Thank you for raising that. Yeah, and I do think we are seeing, unfortunately, in some of our schools, the reaction is to crack down, mm -hmm. punish, suspend, and, and we, we need to really think about that. Is that the right response? Mm -hmm. So great point. Um, I think Ruth had one, and then we'll come over here. So um, actually, uh, follow up to uh, what you were talking about. I think it's really important that we have discussion. It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of a concrete person. <laughs> and I guess what I'm looking for probably you know, from Senator Lewis, 
route is with some of this funding, is there any work on cessation? Because I'm a little unclear on if it does self identify and ask for help. In the old days, I am one of those people who were on SS93, but you know, there were, so we had cessation programs for adults who were trying to quit smoking, um, and then that became increasingly rare. But I don't hear programming for cessation programs for kids, and how can we have those resources available in the schools where the kids are? Try that. Or, yep. yeah, um, you know, as I mentioned when I was talking, it is, it is we're behind in that as a, all of us because pediatricians weren't used to seeing this to this degree. Um, you know, the mass, the quit line can try and connect people to resources. I still suggest people go to their family physicians or their pediatricians to get assistance, um, but we are working on the other end of that, um, which is recognizing that those individuals who care for children need more training in this area. So it is, it is both sides of that. Yeah, I think that, uh, that's what I'm hearing too, is a lot of pediatricians are struggling because they're, they, they don't it. have the patch isn't the answer, yeah. or, you know, nicotine gum. Other traditional techniques are not necessarily the yeah. answer. We need to figure those out. Go, did you want to add something on this? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a group called Thing. Like you couldn't put this 
this dose on someone, mm -hmm. but the patient could probably easily withstand it, but it, it's just, um, so it is something that we really need to be more prepared to help patients deal with if we're asking them, and they do say, oh yeah, you have this problem. Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, I'll check with you on this week. <laughs> because I feel, like, job, I, I feel like in the ER, we, it, it is something that's really tricky that it's going to be a lot, a lot, we're mm -hmm. going to see a lot more. Yeah. And I'm surprised we actually haven't seen more poisonings for um, younger children getting into these things because, you know, little kids are ingesting everything. And so that would be so dangerous to have a child I, I, I think we would see more if it weren't for the fact that the Attorney General passed those regulations years ago around requiring child-resistant child, child resistant packaging. Otherwise, there would be an even more serious issue. Do we have one, one more? We have, a lot of people have questions. Let, let's take, let's try to, well, let's do it real fast. So if you could try to make your point or your question quickly. Um, Thanks. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate all your work. But um, I just wanted to say two quick things. Um, I don't think parents are all aware, and I've been begging my, um, my two kids to go to different high schools principals to tell the parents and they're very reticent to really blast that information out there to parents and I think it's so troubling and I don't know if they don't want their schools to look bad but they it's an emergency and they really need to scream this to the parents because I didn't know I heard about it but then I was shocked when I found out my ninth grader was given vape on the cross country <coughs> bus after a cross-country meet. The least likely group of kids you would expect to be doing it. And then I started telling all my friends and anybody whose kid I knew was doing it, I told their parents. They were all shocked. They couldn't believe their kids were doing this. Parents don't know what to look for because it's so hard to spot. And so the second piece of it is I talked to my pediatrician. You need to push this really hard with the pediatricians. He didn't know what to do. I said, do you have any test kits? Walgreens doesn't have a nicotine urine test. He's like, I don't know. So he's Googling it with me in his office. He's like, oh, it looks like you can order them on Amazon. These professionals need to be telling the parents and the children at every single visit. And if you, I'm just urging you to use your platforms and your authority to push this information to them to get it to the parents because parents can't do anything if they don't know about it. I'm this parent of a uh, ninth grader running, and um, my son didn't have any experience with any of this before, but this past summer he was with some friends in, in August, I believe the end of August, and he um, came and he came home late for dinner one night. I didn't know where he'd been, but he seemed you kind know, of just said he he was tripping, and I just kind of looked at him. I thought he was kidding because he could be a jokester. So um, then I thought he seemed kind of weird, and sure enough, he was tripping, and it was very serious. He had the emergency room. He was he was tripping like it was like on LSD or something, and it was just because he had been passed at one of those dad um, hens of pure THC, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Watching my son go through this, who is such a smart talented kid um, and, and, and then since then he of course has been scared to death of doing that again but he did become addicted to nicotine vaping um, but I, I believe he's over that because I work really hard with him but all of his friends vape it is all over the place it is such a bad it's, it's so scary and they're ruining their brains and these are such gifted kids and, I'm, and, I'm, and I, I wish we, I'm so grateful for this forum thank you So sorry what you've had to go through, and we touched on this tonight. It wasn't really the topic tonight in terms of uh, marijuana and THC, but that intersects with this a lot because um, the same kinds of devices are often used to vape um, THC, and the potency of that is so much greater than in years past. That that's another whole <laughs> concern for another night. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about the um, efforts being made to limit 
the um, marketing and media. You know, we were able to get, um, you know, tobacco off of all of these sites, and and now um, the jewels are taking its place. Is there any um, laws uh, that are going to restrict that? Or is that part of the proposal that you have to make jewels part of the tobacco? Yeah, so you maybe want to comment here, both of you, but um, so um, it gets very tricky when we get into um, legal limits because of commercial free speech, and the limits in the tobacco industry came out of the master settlement, um, the industry basically, that wasn't a part of the agreement. The alcohol industry actually has voluntary uh, uh, restrictions that they Quit. So they, they hold themselves too because they're afraid if they don't, ultimately they could be. Marijuana, because it's federally illegal, one of the things we did when we rewrote the, the law two years ago after it passed at the ballot, we, we, the legislature rewrote it, one of the reasons we did that was to make very strict uh, restrictions on marketing of marijuana products. So for example, all the things we're talking about tonight, you can't do when you market marijuana. You can't do cartoon characters, colorful um, packaging, um, targeting kids, all those things are illegal. And we believe that will stand up against a lawsuit, which we expect will come from the industry because it's illegal federally. But in terms of this, uh, maybe, Alicia, or, or do you want to add to that further in terms of what you think legally we could do to enforce marketing restrictions? Yeah, so I've heard from a lot of folks who are really frustrated. Um, you know, you may have seen Jewel has advertisements on TV. They have run advertisements in the newspaper a week after we announced we were investigating them. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of advertisements on social media, on the homework app, like I mentioned. Um, you know, uh, sort of federally, you know, they're traditional tobacco companies are prohibited from um, advertising on television and radio. And unfortunately, um, those um, restrictions don't apply um, to vaping companies because vaping companies didn't exist when those were created. Um, so I think it's definitely something we're aware of and thinking about as we continue with our investigations, which are ongoing. Um, as the Senator mentioned, it gets tricky because um, we do get into First Amendment territory um, and there have been um, Supreme Court cases, um, including one that our office uh, tried to defend um, around sort of how close to schools you could put billboards with tobacco advertisements um, that have upheld um, tobacco companies' rights to advertise. So it's a sort of delicate delicate balance um, to, to... I think the FDA does have a lot of power here, right? So if the FDA were to take more significant action, they, they probably could. I think um, it's the FTC or FCC that could, yeah, okay. could, could take some additional action. Um, and I know there is mm -hmm. one FCC commissioner who has spoken up about this um, and is looking to do more and also require um, individual, uh, individuals who are um, paid influencers on social media to actually disclose that they're paid and call it an advertisement. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's definitely something um, that ideally would be addressed on the federal level, um, just because that can get, that's obviously gets really hard to try to enforce and police on the state level, um, but so definitely when something. When, when the bill passes that wants these products into the back to that, oh, it won't fall into the same. Fortunately, even though when we passed, that has passed already, and so it does apply, for example, to our smoke free workplace mm -hmm. law, right. but it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't carry <coughs> over to something like uh, marketing restrictions it's that cool. apply to traditional tobacco products, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't automatically carry over. I wish it did. Yeah, and part of what we should probably look at, and just thinking out loud here, is yeah. given that a company like Altria, which is a traditional mm -hmm. tobacco company, now owns a good chunk of, of uh, Juul, mm -hmm. you know, you could argue it's now it's just that. another product in their, in their tobacco portfolio. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a case to be presented. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we could probably take one more. Yep. Um, I just had a couple of action items that was actually one of them, so thank you. Um, another thing is about store placements. When you walk into any stores, the first thing you see is advertisements on the windows and everything near schools, away from schools, which everywhere you go. Um, and then another um, idea that I've talked to a lot of people about, um, we have minor possession laws for alcohol. We don't have a minor possession law for tobacco. It might be illegal to walk into a store and buy a product. It's not illegal to smoke it or possess it. They can go online, they can buy it, a website gets shut down, they just open up a new website. 
So is that something that's going to be hopefully coming down, where there could be a minor possession law? Is it something that's on a town-by-town -town basis? Is it a state basis? How would that work? Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a discussion. Um, you know, I, this kind of goes back to what was sort of was raised earlier, whether the approach, I think, should be one of punishment um, or should be one of education and prevention. I, I tend to come down on the side of, you know, with young people, it's better to educate them and help them when they need, you know, cessation, as opposed to saying it's illegal and now what's going to happen? Do they, do they get a fine? Do they go to jail? Um, <laughs> You know, um, it's already an issue with alcohol in terms of how we even enforce that because we don't enforce it in a consistent way. So that probably wouldn't be the approach I would take, but, you know, that is, it is certainly a, a topic. I don't know if anyone else wanted to comment on yeah, that. I think um, you're correct in that it's not illegal for minors mm -hmm. to possess tobacco products. Um, my understanding is that the laws were um, drafted to take into um, sort of uh, public health into account and not have punitive measures against minors. Um, and I think that's why our office's focus is really on the retailers because it is illegal for retailers to sell to a youth mm -hmm. and they should be educated and they have the training and they shouldn't be providing these products to the youth. So I know um, obviously local boards of health are enforcing against them and we're also enforcing against them um, because there's no reason a youth should be able to get one of these products. Right. And I did mention one of the bills, uh, a new bill, in fact, that I filed the session would significantly increase, in fact, by a factor of 10, the penalties that would be assessed on retailers who sell to minors. So the examples that Maureen gave and, you know, these, these retailers that are breaking the law, that that would really give, I, I would hope, would crack down on them. So. Yes, they could be, yep. Those are like straw purchases. Yep. I just have one announcement to address um, the pediatrician education. I work for the Mystic Valley Public Health Coalition, which is a coalition of local health departments and prevention coalitions, so we're prevention row here. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we have been uh, months in the making of um, hosting Dr. Nicholas Chatty from uh, Boston Children's uh, Adolescent Substance Abuse Program um, to speak directly to local pediatricians and family medicine providers. So um, we're hosting one at SCHA on Tuesday and then again at, um, at the Reading Public Library um, in June. And so that's a pediatrician to pediatrician, family medicine, um, you know, peer to peer conversation about how best to address this in the outpatient clinics um, and in those visits and also how to help support the family. And if anyone has additional questions after this or you want to follow up on anything with any of our panelists, you can always reach out to our office, Senator Lewis's office. Um, if you go to senatorjasonlewis.com, it's got all our contact info and we always want to hear from you. And, continue to work with you. So even as we go from beyond here, please reach out to our office and through us to all our great panelists tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Yep. We, we can get the slides. Uh, just, uh, just email us. Thank you very much to our speakers. Um, thank you, everybody. Good night.